All right. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a different tone uh, to the last presentation, um, a little more of an architectural proposal. Um, I spoke with a few of you before um, the event started, and I got some questions around, like, you know, I'm curious about how to get into machine learning. Like, how should I think about how to, to attack problems, or how should I think of, of how to apply um, what I know uh, about machine learning right now to problem spaces. So I want to tell you a little bit about the journey of my company um, going through that sort of similar sort of problem solving philosophy. So I'm Eric Frey. Um, I'm the head of uh, engineering at a company called Forward. Um, and I'm going to run you through uh, our three easy steps uh, to create an AI doctor. So uh, let me start with um, something that you guys are probably all very familiar with. Um, pretty much any pattern for building an AI system kind of starts like this. Uh, you ingest lots of data, you transform or structure that data somehow, and then you extract some insights, uh, some kind of model for prediction. Um, they all kind of look the same over, over time. Uh, and there's often this sort of like impressive digital brain somewhere in this layout. Uh, it's kind of reassuring, maybe or not. Um, and one of the things I love about these is you're never really sure where the user is in these layouts. Um, whether they're sort of down at the data layer and worshiping robot overlords or what. But um, let me give you a, a pattern that I was pretty familiar with. Um, uh, here's like a super common breakdown for how one of these architectures works. Uh, this is more or less an AI stack that I built uh, years ago at a company called Wavy that was an NLP startup um, based in Seattle. Uh, Wavy took natural language at the bottom um, and then specialized in, in techniques known in general as micro-reading to sort of squeeze out every bit of meaning possible from a sentence to um, extract um, uh, entities and relationships between those entities to populate knowledge bases. Um, so uh, Wavy would scour the web and it would give you anything from you know, predicting that two people got married to um, deaths, baseball scores, concert tour dates, you name it, uh, Wavy would output it. Um, so it was a curated, curated knowledge base of interesting things all around us. And it was an AI stack that was um, particularly interesting to Google at the time. This was 2012. Uh, so we ended up taking it there. Um, as soon as we arrived at Google, they basically said, all right, looks like you guys have a hammer. Let's just try to like hit every nail we possibly can and see what happens. Uh, one domain we tried, um, and this is sort of like the quintessential application of AI in medicine, uh, was clinical decision support. So who, who here knows what clinical decision support is? Cool, okay, reasonable. I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, take a bunch of you know, clinical signs or symptoms or findings, uh, consider them to be features, and what you're gonna output is a classification of like a disease or a medical condition. And there's often uh, an interesting differential diagnostic compo uh, component as well, where you run the model in reverse and say, these are the features I need to understand best to be sure what the actual diagnosis is amongst a number of candidates. Uh, this is um, something that's taught in med school and it's often sort of heralded as like one of the big tech focuses um, in healthcare AI. Um, so on the surface, this sort of stack that I'm showing you here uh, seems pretty reasonable. It seems sort of similar to the previous one, right? Um, we replaced the layer at the bottom with anonymized medical records, which Google had uh, plenty of. And uh, we sort of beefed up the semantics layer at the top uh, with all sorts of interesting uh, techniques, belief propagation, uh, matrix factorization approaches, um, first order logic learning, which was kind of fun. Like you could learn that maybe if your sex was female, then you don't have prostate cancer. Um, so one quick aside, uh, working on this stuff at Google was fantastic because every single one of these boxes, like the premier expert, like the person who invented this thing was in charge of that box, right? So you'd have like the world's foremost expert on Bayesian statistics uh, who wrote the book on it, like designing your graph models. That was really fun. But then at the same time, um, it was exciting in another way because TensorFlow was coming on its own and um, a grad student over the weekend could just throw a neural network together and you know, it would start down at the bottom, character model, and then output like some question answering task. 
and it could do pretty well and it would just smear across this whole architecture smear across like centuries of accumulated experience um, and actually do reasonably well and to me that was like a little bit terrifying and also a little bit fascinating uh, it was fun to see so let's go back to um, the problem at hand so when we tried to apply our approaches to medical records um, let me tell you what we found and this isn't specific to Google really you would you would encounter these problems if you tried this yourself oh and I want to point out this is not an actual private medical record this came from public data set so first challenge um, whole new lex lexicon right like you you cannot imagine the words in medicine or maybe you can but uh, so you have to start from scratch in some ways back to like noun phrase chunking problems getting your boundaries right this wasn't a hard problem per se it was just one that you had to deal with right um, Another example of problems we found trying to understand and structure medical records were just arbitrary formatting constructs, you know? Like uh, sometimes, you know, Google had a lot of these really clever template-based um, parsing uh, models that would just fall over and stuff like this. Like here you've got this like arbitrary white space sort of table layout thing going on in the middle um, and, and medical records were full of this stuff. Uh, another challenge was what I'll call just roughly a noisy graph construction. So um, most sort of newsworthy sort of consumptive uh, text is, is very easy to understand the sort of natural language dependencies. Um, there's a lot of information packed into a single sentence. Um, when you look at medical records, what you find is that there's all this sort of crosstalk uh, where um, really important concepts are connected in ways that are really hard to tweeze out. So here's a good example where had this medical record that wasn't formatted in any sort of problem-oriented way. So you had one part of the record which was talking about all of the different diagnoses that this person had. And then another part of the record, like five paragraphs down, talking about all the medications they left with, and you didn't really know which one went where. And so those sorts of connections were really important. Uh, another problem uh, was that even if you could do a good job, there was no guarantee that the actual diagnostic classifications in those data sets were any good. We're living in a world where one in five people, I just read this like a few days ago, one in five people are still experiencing diagnostic medical errors, right? So if that's your training set to start with, you're sort of like in a little bit of an uphill battle. So just the class labels themselves are problematic. And then the last point I'll make is, is it, you know, especially from Google's point of view, these medical records were not really big data. Um, uh, medical data in the U.S., you can imagine it as sort of living in this distributed system where the primary node is still the fax machine, right? So, so really doing like MapReduce across that is pretty tricky. So we, we, we stopped working on it. Um, that project, you know, you could spend a lot of time in that space and you're lucky to pull out something that reads the word cough in a medical record and says, mm, you probably have a cold. Um, so we abandoned that effort and we moved on to other things. So a few years passed. Uh, it was an exciting time at Google. Uh, folks were running around sticking <laughs> glucose monitors into each other's eyeballs. Other people were strapping Wi-Fi routers to, to giant building-shaped trash bags. Um, uh, I was part of a team that at the time had taken sort of a, a controversial stance that, look, all this innovation is super exciting. Um, but if you truly care about impact and you truly care about what the next big bets should be, maybe you shouldn't be starting from the technology and working forwards to a solution, which is frequently how things would happen at Google, but perhaps instead let's work from a problem backwards. So let's deeply understand an industry or a sector or a problem or a space um, and then decide whether or how Google could help. And so that was a team that um, I worked on for, for a couple of years. It was a lot of fun. So one of the spaces we looked at uh, was healthcare. And what we found was, was pretty astonishing. And you have to remember this, like our team was, was looking at domains like food and agriculture. We were looking at climate change. We were looking at um, the urban fabric was, was one of our projects. And far and away, healthcare just blew us away in terms of the, the problem size and the opportunities. Um, so let me talk about sort of the, the three big problems we found in healthcare, sort of working backwards a systems analysis of what's broken in healthcare in the U.S. today. Um, the first problem is all about just access, right? So how do you get access to 
you know, getting the right person in front of like the right medical resource, whether that's like expertise, um, objective data collection about what's going wrong with them, consumables or procedures once you do know what's wrong. Um, it's partially a cost issue. It's partially even just purely an availability issue. And no matter how you cut it, um, the calculus you end up at is labor, right? Like how do you distribute really expensive labor is a really fascinating problem. Um, and when you look at that, you basically have to boil it down to where does a doctor spend their time today, right? Um, how many care hours can they serve based on what they're, what they're doing? Um, and when you look at this, one of the things that really sort of stands out, um, and this is a well-known stat, is that for every doctor a minute spends with you, they spend two minutes charting, right? Uh, it's really fascinating. And so when we were looking at this, the first thing I did was I sort of dusted off my old like Google projects and you know, looked at my, my old like clinical decision support uh, code. And, and I looked at this graph and I said, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe that's not the right problem to work on, right? Um, next big problem is outcomes. Uh, this is perhaps the, the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart. Uh, this is a bit of a, of a controversial stat. Um, there's been a lot of debate about it recently. Um, but medical error, depending on how you count it, is the third leading cause of death in the US. Um, and whether you believe that or not really comes down to whether you think this red section here is an error. Uh, so let me tell you what those three categories are. So the blue bucket is what's known as error by commission. This is the one you guys see in the movies where you know, a surgeon like accidentally cuts an artery. Um, the yellow bucket is diagnostic errors, so that's just like, I have the right data, but I made the wrong call, and that's probably a place where clinical decision support could actually help. But then that giant red bucket, what's known as errors by omission communication context, that's just where some coordination of care issue happened. And what that means is, is someone forgot to tell someone something, or you had one hospital that knew some information about a patient, but the other hospital didn't. Um, and so that seems like a really big problem to solve. And so again, I thought about, you know, this sort of clinical decision support stuff that I worked on, and I looked at this and I said, maybe there's a more important bucket to start in. Okay, and the third bucket, uh, I'll do this one really quickly. If there's nothing else um, that you could come at this industry with from just sort of crass Silicon Valley eye, you would say it's just terrible user experience, right? Long wait times, um, mobile is still sort of a new concept in a lot of healthcare, um, so you have to come in for pointless stuff. Um, how many people here know what NPS is? Okay, uh, net promoter score. It's basically uh, a way of knowing whether someone likes a product or service. 100 is great. Um, I think you can go negative. Like a really good NPS, like a MacBook Pro has an NPS of like 80. The average NPS of a primary care clinic in the US is four, right? So there's, there's some room for improvement. Okay, so those kind of were the three big problems. And for those sort of three reasons together, we chose to build forward. Uh, so there's lots of ways to describe what it is. Um, it's a doctor's office of the future. Uh, I think for this audience, uh, it's fair to say that forward is a statement. Uh, it's sort of this architectural philosophy that I was talking about earlier, that the biggest leverage, sort of the biggest opportunity for change comes from going full stack to solve all those three problems at the same time. Because they're really inter interlinked. They're, they're, they're massively interlinked. And so if you want to impact healthcare, maybe what you do is you interject yourself right into the middle of the actual practice of medicine. And once you're in there, you change everything, right? So let's come back to that notion of that sort of architectural machine learning platform, right? So if you actually own the practice of healthcare, what can you change? Well, maybe one of the first things that you can do is you can take that sort of read-only model and now you can make it right. Right? because you actually own the practice and you actually own the recording of that data. Um, and also, you have access to the doctor's brain. Uh, so at Forward, we've looked very closely at doctor brains. Um, we've reverse engineered them, and then we've put them back together piece by piece in a way that lets us sort of safely and quickly automate parts of it. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, oh, and so now let's actually start talking about the three steps, which was the, the title of this presentation. So step one, if you own the writing, one of the first things you can do is get rid of all this stuff at the bottom, right? Uh, I sort of gave you guys a bunch of clues already that natural language is kind of a mess. Um, it's really not an ideal format for representing medical knowledge. Um, so if you own this sort of bi-directional pipeline, 
first thing you can do is come up with your own language to represent medical knowledge. So that's one thing we did. Uh, we developed our own me medical language. We borrowed uh, from some existing medical schemas. There's one called SNOMED. We stole a little bit out of, uh, but we ultimately sort of Frankenstein our own thing. And so in our world, if a patient comes to us and they report pain, um, rather than just write like this story in a text box, uh, that pain has a pathology, it has a physiology, it has a severity, it has a course. And those are all things we can record very precisely. And all the tools we built um, manipulate those knowledge representations directly rather than the underlying text. So I'll give you an example of one of those tools. Uh, so when a patient visits uh, one of our doctors on site, um, they interact with this smart screen uh, collaboratively with the doctor that navigates their, their medical history, uh, their lab and imaging results, their problems, their plans and goals. Uh, and it's a tool. It's a tool for writing and documenting. And so even as the doctor and the patient are having a conversation, all of that is being um, structured on the fly through this sort of like medical ID in the background. And so it's not just this like magical experience, but at the end of the visit, uh, we have this semantic representation and the notes are already written. So if you think about that time spent chart I showed you before, where like one third of the doctor's time is spent charting, like we just took a huge dent out of that. Um, so we're really happy with how that's working. So that's step one. So step two is now that you've got this way to represent and store medical semantics, you need to start thinking about what are the ways that you manipulate and operate um, those semantics and those symbols. Um, so this part is a little unsexy, but it's actually really, really important. Um, we built uh, sort of our version of an of a EMR, uh, of an electronic health, health record, but usually when you see EMRs, if you've ever gone to a doctor's office and asked them to like swivel this thing around that looks like it was built in Visual Basic in like the 1980s, um, what you'll find is that it's just a, a billing tool with a text box, right? Uh, so we made ours very different. Ours um, actually models all of the workflows that happen in a clinical environment down to the task level. And that allows us to instrument our processes to an insane degree. Um, and we know exactly which parts of our workflows we need to focus on and improve. And this framework also gives us a really safe scaffolding to start taking these pieces apart and replacing them with more ML and, and AI bots over time, which is something we're already starting to do. I'll give you another sort of visualization of this. Uh, uh, is one small part of, of our sort of like workflow tapestry. It's kind of sanitized. We actually designed this in code. Um, but each one of these steps that you see here, it has an SLA. Um, it has ways to alert us if something is stuck. It has ways to optimize and improve patient experience over time. Think about throughput. Think about error rate. Like this is a very important sort of architectural component of our system. So step three. This is the fun part, right? Now that you've got this good symbolic representation and you have this operation framework in place, now you can start actually doing that automation. So tasks that used to be operated by people can now be taken over by bots. And this is a framework, right? So you know, how we build the bots um, is, is really cool. It maybe is a separate talk. But I'll give you guys a few hints as to what's going on here, right? So, the first thing is, is, is now that our data is highly structured, we have this framework for comparing operations across the different doctors in our group. So we can introduce ways to, for example, reduce error by looking at overlap, uh, run the same judgments over the same, uh, sorry, run different judgments over the same chart. Um, so you can think of it as sort of like a built-in second opinion system. Um, we built this, this little bit of a, of a debate with our doctors, but we finally convinced them to use a bit of a GitHub model so that when they actually check in charts, there's like a peer review component. Um, it's pretty cool, but they definitely uh, caused some consternation for a while. Uh, another thing you can do is you can encode best practices directly into the system, and you can do it just imperatively. Like It turns out that doctors actually think very algorithmically. Um, and if you give them a chance uh, to express you know, some interesting research they found on like the best uh, clinical algorithm for handling high blood pressure and you give them the framework to actually encode that, they will. Um, and so, you know, we like to joke that, you know, we're slowly turning our doctors into DevOps. Uh, we think it's funnier than they do, but. 
And yes, this is absolutely a space uh, for us to do um, interesting ML as well. Um, but you know, it's worth pointing out that because um, we've built this sort of very precise knowledge representation to begin with, um, we haven't needed that as much in the early days, but we are starting to do some of that work. So if, if this is sort of a proposal for an architecture, then you know, the proof's in the pudding, right? So how are we doing in this? Um, so one of the things to, to give you a little bit of context is that Ford as a, as a healthcare provider offers essentially concierge uh, level of medical service. So a concierge doctor is someone who's probably available to you uh, 24 seven. Um, so we do that. We have 24 seven access to the care team and the doctors in our system. Uh, you have unlimited visits. Uh, you can take unlimited labs if you want. Um, and in fact, many of our members are refugees from the sort of concierge doctor world. So that's like kind of the SLA that we try to keep or in some cases exceed. So we've been doing this for about a year and a half. Um, and we're a little more than an order of magnitude cheaper than concierge. So we're at about sort of Equinox membership fee, right? Uh, we're pushing slowly and, and steadily towards sort of Netflix subscription land. Um, and eventually we want to be free. That's our goal. Um, I had a hard time finding something that was $1 a month. So that's Dollar Shave Club. Um, so another way to think about how we're doing is um, right now uh, we're at about two locations, but, but more on the way. Um, but I, I'm actually in some ways deeply uninterested um, in telling you about our locations. What's more interesting is to tell you um, how many of our members' problems we solve without them ever even coming in. Uh, so part of the concierge experience is this mobile app. Um, and today, about 40% of the cases that our members have um, are solved through the mobile app. Uh, and this is why I'm so excited about companies like Cardiogram, because um, the big bottleneck to raising that number comes from being able to push more diagnostic ability into the home and directly onto the person. Like we've done the stats. That's literally like one of the first things we need to get that number to go up. So from 40 to 50 to 60, at some point, you start to realize that you just don't need the clinic anymore, right? And that's where we're trying to get. So it's healthcare that's uh, always with you. It's always available. It's insanely cheap. And it's more effective. Uh, and that's where we're headed. Any questions? So when you go to see a doctor and you get a medical treatment plan, let's say, and let's say it involves other providers. Yeah. For sure. Uh, often, those other providers aren't within the network that the initial physician is in, particularly the primary care physician. So then, it, so they don't really know what goes on until someone comes back with the diagnosis, comes back in. So there's sort of that gap that goes on. Mm -hmm. so there's things like fire and the um, H07 substitute. There's still the issue of the semantic and the syntax going back and forth outside of the closed system. Addressing. Yeah, that's a great question. Your ontology has got like ICD 12, I think it's supposed to be right? Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, we have ways of mapping our ontology back to some of the more common formats. Um, it's uh, roughly a superset, at least for the spaces we care about. Um, but that's only half the battle, right? The real challenge is, is the transport. Uh, the real challenge is um, convincing people to stop using fax. Uh, and there, there's, there's two things we can do. So the first is we can sort of be the citizen in the world that we want to live in. And so it's not launched yet, but we are working on uh, some uh, public facing ingestion tools that, you know, we want to be one of the first healthcare providers where it's like, hey, do you want to access your data? Do you want to OAuth it to other people? Like, let's, let's make that really easy to do. Um, the second part of it is that we, we have to operate our own fax bank and we have to be that interchange for the time being. And we, wor we work with a couple of companies here in the Bay Area who we're just waiting for someone to crack it to, to, to figure out this two-sided market. Uh, there's a great company in the Bay Area called Picnic Health um, the, that I, I hope can succeed. So related question to that, the 
I think we just partially asked about the coordination of care, right? So mm -hmm. the set of conditions that a CP is like, you know, can diagnose and write uh, prescriptions to, but then there are others that specialists take over where the PCP is kind of the quarterback and the coordinator. So how do you solve the problem where a lot of the information about what's happening is not in your in your role, right? The, yeah. You know, but it's medications or the, or the charts and the like, information about the conditions, like living in someone's, you know, epic MR, or some other, right. you know, place. Yeah. Or is that kind of not in the scope of conditions that are covered really well currently? That's a really good question. So the question was essentially like, how, how do you coordinate care? Um, what can you do differently in this world um, compared to sort of what's already out there? Um, and you're absolutely right that there are big challenges with, so a common source of medical error is you see someone as a primary care provider, um, maybe you semi-diagnose them with something, uh, maybe you give them a medication to start, you send them to a specialist, that specialist changes their prescription list, and then you never get that feedback, right? You never hear about that, and now you're in a dangerous place with that patient. Um, what we can do when we're small, it's the hacky solution, is we manually curate the specialists we work with to find ones who are willing to do a better job with us on data interchange. So for example, we work with a great company called Physera for all of our physical therapy needs, started by a former head of data science at Facebook or something. And they've got this beautiful app, uh, they have an API, we can talk to them directly, and records exchange can happen in seconds. Um, where we can't do that, we at least maintain relationships so that we can get the time to learn what happened to a visit down to, you know, days or less. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a hard problem. And like, this is part of the trade-off of, of this kind of bet is that we're verticalizing and we're owning um, one space, which is primary care, and there's already enough to do in that space. Um, and then within that envelope, we'll change a lot of things. And then the rest of the world will we'll just have to do what we can. Yeah. So uh, in your problem statement that you're showing these numbers, uh, there were 251k medical errors. Is that over one year or? That's per year. Yeah. In so we, we kill a jumbo jet of people <coughs> per day due to medical errors. Uh, so then when do you expect to see your first error in the system? Is, is it possible to get that kind of learning? Hmm, what can I tell you? Uh, so I'll give you the trite answer, which is that um, medical errors happen all the time, right? Uh, there are different categories, and that's very important. The serious ones are super rare, but the, the common sort of oops things happen every single day. Uh, we instrument those. Um, well, there's, there's two ways to think about how you measure your quality as a healthcare provider. One is by measuring your output. And that's tricky because sometimes you need like high numbers to do that. It's like, um, how, how healthy is my population relative to the general population? How are they doing on, how well am I managing their diabetes, that sort of stuff. And there's like well-known metrics for doing that sort of thing. But you can also instrument a lot of your operational components, and I sort of hinted at some of that, where you can say very, very cleanly, how am I doing following up on the issues that I said I was going to? How are my operations actually scaling as I gain more members. Yeah. How do your patients or potential new customers feel about you owning and using all of their personal medical data? That's an interesting question. So the question was, how do our members feel about us owning and using all of their uh, medical data? Um, I think there's probably two ways to answer that. So the first is I was very worried when we first started this company that um, privacy was going to be uh, a major concern, um, both sort of from a regulatory standpoint and then also a product positioning standpoint. Um, and this is something that, you know, it's funny, especially when you're in the software world, there are a few spaces you just know not to go to because you're like, I've heard bad things and I'm just going to stay away. What really surprised me, and maybe this is something a little bit particular to primary care, is that the regulations, frankly, like, so HIPAA is the main one for, for patient privacy, honestly kind of reasonable. It's stuff like, if you have a waiting room, don't have a giant sign that says now serving with people's names on it, right? Uh, it tells you a lot about how to encrypt your data um, um, at rest and in transit. And a lot of these things today, um, there are already platform as a service providers out there that um, you check a box and you're essentially HIPAA compliant if you work with them. So 
Um, if any of you are thinking of doing something, don't let that be the thing that dissuades you. So the second part of it then is, is how has it been received by our members? Um, you, you, have, you have one key leverage, which is if you're doing something for them, and, you're, and, and this is actually baked into, into the regs too, right? It's very important that you only use medical data in someone's care. Um, that value prop to them is instantly like, it's no big deal, you can do what you want. You want me to stand in front of you naked, hop up, on, up and down on one foot, like it's, it's fine. Yes. Um, I see that you know you're tracking sleep and stuff. So are you connecting to patients' wearables? Are you giving them wearables? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So the question is, um, are we are we working with with wearables to track patient information? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we actually do some hardware development. Uh, we are a very multidisciplinary shop. We only do it when we can't find a great solution out of the box. Uh, so one great example is. Um, Super unsexy, but uh, the 15 minutes it sometimes takes to collect all of your vitals uh, when you first go to see a doctor, we figured out a clever solution to allow that to happen in a single hardware device. Um, it's enormous. Uh, it lives in the clinic. Maybe at some point, if we have the resources, we'll miniaturize it. Um, but what we really want, like I was saying before, is an ecosystem of, of you know, the cardiograms and the alive pores of the world to really take over. We, we don't want to do that. We simply want to be the platform. If you ask the average doctor today, um, you know, would, would you like to have your patient's step counts? They'll say, yeah, sure, that sounds great. And you say, okay, what are you gonna do with it? And like, I have no idea, right? And so we just wanna be that sort of interpretation layer. We certainly don't wanna do the hardware development. So when you, when you visit, if, if, you, if you come by, uh, we have a, a location on Kearney and Sutter, you'll see this kind of, it's a bit silly, this like, Apple retail display case that shows a lot of the devices we work with. Um, and that part is, it's actually hasn't been hard to integrate. Yes? So you're talking about how um, doctors spend twice as much time writing up notes as they do spending time with patients, and how like Forward has a solution where the notes get written at the end of the meeting. Could you talk about how that, how that works? Is that automated or is that during the meeting the doctor's filling out information? It's a great question. Uh, so the question is, um, how are the notes actually getting um, recorded into that sort of semantic network that um, I referenced. Um, first way to answer that is magically. Uh, when you're having this conversation with the doctor, um, he's operating the screen, he or she is operating the screen, and um, uh, some of that is very imperative and it's very easy to understand what's going on, but then sometimes you're having a conversation and the screen is just populating and sometimes it kind of creeps people out They're like whoa where did that come from right like are you guys doing speech to text nlp uh i want to remind you we, we built a primary care practice in a year uh we we didn't have time to build many of those components and so we did this kind of wizard of oz thing uh where behind the scenes um, we trained medical scribes to operate this sort of new um uh, medical semantics and so they, they are still doing a lot of the heavy lifting to transcribe um, a visit in real time. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was interested in your task management system or whatever, whatever that part. And I guess the question was, does it handle sort of just you know, sort of operational things like you know, scheduling the staff for lab tests, or do you also like encode you know, complicated clinical protocols? In this case? It's a great question. Um, you absolutely travel up the curve of complexity. Our first versions um, were, were little more than uh, um, gophers, right, for doing a lot of just the stuff that a care coordinator um, or an, an MA might handle for you in, in a clinic. Uh, now that the system has been stable and our, our first clinic has been running for a few months and we've had some more time to invest in that technology, it's starting to do some of the things that a nurse practitioner would do, which is pretty neat. Uh, we're very, very careful to never supersede a doctor's judgment. So at a certain layer, it will only suggest, it won't override. Um, but examples of some of the things uh, it can do these days is uh, uh, intelligent follow-up um, on uh, certain plans that the doctor developed with you where we know that there's a certain curriculum for how we want to reach out to a person. A little bit chatbotish in a way. Um, we're also uh, getting it to do some things like um, uh, detect 
and, and correctly deal with certain critical vital signs that come in from our devices and, and understand how to triage them and, and, and act appropriately. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's and, and this one of these things where as we, Neil is, is an engineer at Ford, so he knows this, um, the, the sea change that happened after we launched the first few, and then the doctors were like, oh, wait, you can do that? Can you also do this for me? Can you also do this? And they just see their like calendars clearing, and that makes them very excited. Yes? So when you were doing your work in um, clinical decision support, did you find that certain specialties could benefit more from um, the tools you're building? I'll give you an example. So about 10 years ago when I was working with um, a neurologist, we were doing patient rounds, and um, a lot of the patients, the symptoms that we were seeing, everything felt really random. So the patient would have a seizure and then nothing else and just wanted to know if that would happen again or what would happen. Another person fainted, hit their head, and we didn't know, you know what the issue was. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, absolutely. So, so, so the question is, does, do certain specialties benefit more or less from clinical decision support? Um, uh, absolutely, that's the case. Um, the, the obvious answer I'll go past really quickly is uh, anything with imaging data, right? Um, that's where a lot of this stuff has been really picking up. Um, uh, when, we, when we worked on this, um, it, w it was in primary care. We didn't distinguish back then um, whether certain specialties were doing better and worse. A lot of our uh, data came from uh, hospitals, right, which see, see a lot of everything. Um, but I believe that if we had, we probably would have found something like what you said. Great. Thank you.